This is Joey Sharamati from Koyo, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And in the guest host chair this week, I've got a first timer to the show, and I'm very excited to bring you Will Goodyear of Hope's Fall. Will, say hello. Hey, Keith, and uh, hey, everybody. It's really cool to be here. I'm a big fan of what you do. And uh, yeah, I don't think we've ever had a conversation, so this is pretty cool. No, we had a brief conversation after Furnace Fest last year. I didn't get the opportunity to say hello in person, but I saw you perform with Hope's Fall at the fest, and it was really awesome. Oh, and I got to see you twice because I saw that Thursday pre-show as well. Yeah, that was awesome. That show was really fun. Obviously, the fest show was super, uh, just a great experience all around. But um, yeah, man, I'm glad you got to check out both. Those were my first two shows with Hope's Fall since 2003. So I'm glad you thought it was okay. <laughs> I have- yeah, we actually talked about this in our furnace fest debrief episode last year just you were just locked in like you had been a member of the band the whole time but you had actually played with them previously in 2003 yeah that's how um yeah that was my first like experience with hopes falls they needed a a fill-in um in two in the summer of 2003 so i ended up playing a couple a few fests like Hellfest, furnace fest crazy fest and then i did like a i don't know four to six week tour i can't remember with that uh with uh juliana theory so, and then I moved, moved along to do some other things, but, um, yeah, so it's really cool to link back up with those dudes. They, I mean, they've always been super good friends of mine and now just, uh, being in that band is, it, I feel pretty, pretty lucky and it's super fun. That's awesome. Yeah. One of my favorite bands and still putting out great material to this day. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I, recently we played a show in, uh, New York and i was having a conversation with, with someone afterwards. And they're like, man, it's just, just talking about how big of a fan of the band they are. And I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, me too. It's like, (laughs) I'm still (laughs) like, I'm in the band now, but it's, I still just feel like a fan. So, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Like I'm playing stuff that I've, I've always loved with people that I love and yeah, it's awesome. That is awesome. And speaking of awesome, we've got a great interview this week to bring you the one, the only, Vinny Caruana of The Movie Life and I Am The Avalanche. That interview is coming up in a few minutes, but we really cover it all. Coming up in the Long Island scene, his time with The Movie Life, forming I Am The Avalanche, starting up Head Automatica with Daryl Palombo. All of it, all of it is coming up momentarily. Well, I'm excited. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, I don't know Vinny personally, but I... I I would love to meet him at some point. And I'm, I've played in Long Island so many times back in the day. And yeah, I'd like to hear what he has to say about that, like coming up in that scene. Yeah, it, he has a lot of good stories. And I love when guests are like this, you know, just stuff I wasn't expecting, stuff I was expecting, but just the way he tells the stories and the way he presents everything, really good. You're going to really love it. Some surprises in there too. So that's coming up in a minute. But first, here's how you can support us, the new scene. And I'm just going to continue to ask for two things to our listeners. And look, enough messing around. We got to get down to brass tacks here. We only need 15 more Apple Podcast reviews to get us over 100. Now, I look at the numbers, okay? I see how many people listen to this show, and it is way more than 15. So if you haven't hit that five-star button in the Apple Podcast application yet, do it right now. Do it right now as you're listening to the show. Open it up. Click the new scene. Scroll down just a little bit. You'll see the stars. Hit the five-star button. We got to get over 100. I just want us to be over 100. And then I'm going to give it a rest for a while. So thank you to everybody who has submitted a review. Please get us 15 more. And then I can stop saying this every week for a little while until we do our next push. And shirts, we do have shirts available in the Death Wish Inc. store. Head on over there, search the new scene. We've got t-shirt options. We've got a wonderful long sleeve option 
Fall is coming. There's a nice chill in the air today, and I love it. Get yourself a shirt before Furnace Fest and wear it to the fest. I'm trying to get together a gang of people to wear new scene shirts at Furnace Fest. I will be one of them. Yes, I'm going to wear my own shirt for the entire weekend because, Will, if I'm not going to promote myself, who is? I mean, come on. I have absolutely no problem with that. I think it's great. And I have one of those long sleeves, and it is dope, and I totally encourage anyone else to go get one. It's sick. Yes, Will himself has one. And I think you should, too, to everybody who's listening. So go check it out and make sure you support Iodine Recordings. The Darling Fire are playing Friday at noon at Furnace Fest. Make sure sure you get there on time to see them. Their album Distortions is coming out soon, and it's so, so good. I can't wait to see them in person. Hey Thanks is playing an after-party show that Friday at the Nick. I didn't get the chance to see Hey Thanks when they came through, but I'm definitely going to see them at this show as long as I can stay awake long enough because it's going to be a long day and I'm old and I'm tired all the time. So looking forward to that. So Will, let's talk about what we're listening to. And I want to start with you. Lay it on us. What are you listening to lately? Uh, This is always a good question. Um, I tend to resort back to my mid, early to mid nineties, like metal and grunge and hip hop sort of like um, my go-tos. But in terms of newer things, um, actually two of your recent uh, episodes really got me stoked on a couple things. The Greek death episode. Um, that's a band that Josh from hopes fall had like pushed on me early and I, I was slacking on them, but I, once I got into it, I've been listening to them like a lot. So yeah, thanks to you and Josh for turning me on to that. And then uh, the recent episode with uh, about cold cave and um, American nightmare. Like I've always, I've loved American nightmare. And then I, I got into cold cave back like, early on, I guess, but I didn't really, I didn't even know it was him, (laughs) which after (laughs) listening to the interview um, with Wes, like, I guess that was by design. Uh, But yeah, so I've I've been digging back into them since listening to that episode. Um, And then, yeah, just some of my favorite, like heavy bands. Uh, I always go back to Satyricon. I mean, they don't have anything new, but that's probably my favorite heavy band of all time. There's a band out of Richmond called Inner Arma um, who've been around for a long time and recently did a show with them. So that got me stoked on listening to their stuff again. Yeah. So I don't know. There's a little rundown of a few things. Some excellent choices in there. Some excellent choices. And I've said it before, but my favorite part of the show is when I'm editing it, I go and I jump into YouTube and I listen to all of the bands people mention. So I get to hear older stuff, newer stuff, and it's just a good way to get exposed to a ton of music. Yeah. Yeah. I need to, I need to be better about seeking out new music, but got a few friends that push me to do so. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad Josh is pushing a uh, great death on everybody because I am too. And, uh, they're a great band. Yeah. They're in- insanely good. I mean, it, it, on so many levels, um, just the maturity and the songwriting and, and obviously in the playing and even just the way they're like the sounds that they're getting on their recordings. It, it's, it's a whole a list of reasons why I really like that band. And I'm listening to a lot of Slow Crush. I love bands that are doing like the newer shoegaze post-hardcore crossover thing. So any band doing that and doing that effectively, I'm instantly going to love. I think Psalm, I think Holy Fawn, I think Deaf Heaven, all great bands. But Slow Crush, I've been listening to their albums a lot. Super, super good. And Will, some music news in your world, Hopes Fall, Saskatchewan is finally on Spotify. So I'm going to be rocking that a lot today. I used to have to go to YouTube and listen to it there, but now I can listen to it on the go because it's been added as a bonus track on the Magnetic North album on Spotify. Yeah, I just saw, um, actually, Josh posted about it on, on Instagram. I saw that. That was news to me, but very cool. Yeah, it's a cool song. All right, so check back in with me and Will in segment three. We're going to talk to Will We're going to dig into some of his history. We're going to ask about joining Hope's Fall. We're going to cover everything. But right now, we are going to speak to Vinny Caruana of The Movie Life. Enjoy. We're here now with Vinny Caruana. Vinny, welcome to the show. What's up? Thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being here, Vinny. You know, you've done so much in music over the years between The Movie Life and I am the Avalanche, and of course, your solo work, and uh, we're going to cover all of that. But first, Vinny, let me ask you, how are you doing today? I'm doing well today. Um, 
I am not much of a morning person. I, I go to bed really, I'm like a 3 a.m. to bed kind of guy. <laughs> I get a lot of creative stuff done in the late hours, not the early hours. So I just actually woke up and me and my wife just had breakfast in our neighborhood with a very old friend of ours who actually introduced us to each other in 2003. Oh, wow. Uh, so yeah, I'm just coming back from breakfast. It's a beautiful day in Brooklyn. There's much to look forward to in this life and I'm feeling good. How are you feeling? Uh, pretty much the same. I, I'm feeling good. The weather is super nice. There's never any shortage of awesome things to do lately, which I love because I remember the days when I would sit around miserable with nothing to do a lot and that wasn't a lot of fun. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I look forward to each day. You know, I want to be a late night guy. Uh, I love being up at night working on the show and various other things, but uh, I usually fall asleep by like 11 or 12. Right. And, uh, oh, well, I have to anyway, because I work a nine to five, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. Where in Brooklyn are you at? I'm in Greenpoint. Oh, okay. I'm in Williamsburg. Oh, shit. <laughs> we we could have done this face to face. We're like practically <laughs> neighbors. You know, I, I actually thought of that because we've been working on putting this together, but I actually don't know had to record it in person right it's easier this way yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i bought i bought equipment when we first started to like do it in person but I, I don't know how to do it anymore so i have to figure that out in case anyone's local and wants to come by sometime yeah yeah i mean you probably get a slightly different kind of conversation you know what i mean let's get to know you a little bit Vinny. so you grew up in new york on long island yes yep i, I grew up in a town called north merrick uh on the south shore of long island in nassau county so tell us about that and uh, tell us about like your intro to music and kind of discovering punk rock and all that stuff. Have, have you always been into music? I have. Um, so musically speaking, our I have two older brothers. I have a dad and a mom who are, are both music fans. So from a very young age, we learned how to use the record player. We kind of would hang out around the record player and music was always on no matter what we were doing. Um, so my earliest music memories are a lot of uh, Kiss, Queen. Mm, my mom's favorite is Paul Simon. So that was kind of in our realm. A lot of the band. Um, and then when we started being able to buy our own record, like we would allowed, to, you know, we were allowed to pick records out and stuff. We started getting more into like basically hip hop and metal. So like we would get a Judas Priest record, but we would get a public enemy record. Um, and that, that was our, the first mer music that we bought was that kind of stuff was like hip hop and metal. And then my, one of my older brothers, both of my older brothers uh, went to a hardcore show on Long Island in like 1991, maybe. And, uh, and here we are. <laughs> fast forward to you know they came home they brought home seven inches from local long island bands who had records and who were who had a scene and my brother was in a band but they didn't you know they would just play with bands from our town and basically my brother meeting a bunch of other people like him uh he's like five years older than me but like him my brother basically befriended like all of like who are now like Long Island legendary bands who, you know, are responsible for influencing the next wave of Long Island bands who, who really did get out there and who the world is familiar with, you know? Um, yes. but all of that had to do with my older brother and his band being friends with some other guys who were kind of forging a scene. Long Island is like a, uh, a beacon for hardcore, you know, just so many legendary bands have come out of their, and continue to come out of there. Yeah, I mean, there's so many people here uh, on Long Island. There's so many, like, the island that we now, that we're sitting on, uh, even though it's called Brooklyn. There's so many people and so many kids. And, you know, obviously we have New York City at our fingertips once we were old enough um, to experience that on our own. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, it is pretty staggering the amount of, good musicians and bands that have come out of this tiny little strip. It's pretty cool. And it's, and, and it's rad to be able to be a small part of that for sure. 
right? I mean, did you imagine going to those first shows that you'd be here all these years later talking to me about the uh, lifetime of music you've created and continue to create? No, I, I didn't. I didn't even think about being in a band until the summer that I graduated high school. So from like age 12 to 17, I just existed in the scene and had friends and, t- you know, took part in that community. And then one day I was singing with Glassjaw on one of their tunes. How did that happen, by the way? Uh, me and Daryl grew up together and uh, one of their songs, I-, I could always sing. Like we would sing when we were like driving around in my Jeep and shit, you know? Yeah. I could always sing and stuff, but... um. When you were in the Jeep driving around singing, would anyone ever be like, hey, your voice is great? Because I, I would kind of try to like play that game and sing a song and see if anyone would be like, hey, you should sing for X, but it, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, no, my voice was a lot different when I was, um, when I first started, my voice was very like, I didn't really know how to project it. And yeah. so the earliest movie life recordings, like the the red demo is what it's called. Um, I'm kind of like this, like I'm singing like this. I had this, that was my approach. And from, from 1997 until now, even though I've gotten older, my range has improved like a lot. So talk about getting started with the movie life. Now, this is a pretty interesting story. Daryl helped you out a little bit, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, so I'm singing with Glassjaw at like a show. I believe it was in someone's basement. Um, I sang a song of theirs that had had like two vocal parts that was on like their first EP. And um, Eddie Reyes, who went on to form Taking Back Sunday, and obviously I don't need to explain how much of an impact that band's had uh, on the world. But um, Eddie saw me singing with Daryl and asked me to if I was interested in trying out for a new thing that he was doing. That was ended up being movie life. Um, didn't have a name yet, and that's honestly like that's it. I wasn't like, oh, I got to start a band. It was more like it was put into my lap. Like, do you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try. So they gave me a song that they wrote and just like a blank song, and was like, all right, cool. So write over this, and that's your tryout, kind of. So I didn't know what I was doing. So Daryl, we were at Daryl's uh, parents' house, and. Um, we yeah we just went into a he had like a book of poems and lyrics and things and we just took something out of there and put it to the song that they had given me and yeah and that was it they're like cool you're in the band i was probably like i think they definitely like you did this i'm like yeah yeah just kind of (laughs) lying just kind of lying but yeah like daryl helped me with a few of the early movie life songs and then you know, as far as melody and stuff like that goes, like that kind of stuff came pretty quickly after that. Like it was always in me and the music I was raised on was like ingrained in me. So, you know, it was there. I didn't know it was there, but the ability to put a melody over music and put lyrics into that melody came pretty quick. And I kind of put the pressure on myself immediately. I was like, I was definitely not trying to like, I wanted to I wanted to write and I had a lot to say and and I was a you know 17 year old dude who who had feelings about things <laughs> <laughs> and um or 18 maybe I was 18 and um yeah so pretty quickly I started doing it on my own and and figuring it out and uh and that's fun and it's still fun I just got back from the studio last night like I still have so 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 much fun figuring things out musically, problem solving, um, waking up one morning, scrapping everything and starting over and making it better than it was. And that's the kind of stuff that I like. I still love touring and performing and stuff, but I think writing and recording is, is what fulfills me the most right now. Yeah, that's the most fun part of the whole thing. Like I, writing is so hard. I always put it off until the last absolute minute that i can but when you have the breakthrough and you finally put vocals to things and especially when you're recording it and you hear what's been rattling around in your head the whole time it's it's the best it's so rewarding um yeah yeah so i'm just coming out i'm just coming off an experience yesterday where i was definitely in the vocal booth kind of welling up with tears not because i had like 
you know, broken the matrix and I have my big hit single and this is going to be <laughs> my big break. It was more like, I worked fucking hard as hell on this song. I saw, I, I broke through a lot of walls and the result, you know, watching it come to life, listening it, to it come to life as you're in the vocal booth, was just like the best. And that, that feeling um, has only gotten better throughout the years. Like it doesn't, it doesn't wear off. It just, it's stronger now. I love that. I love that you still love it too, because, you know, as we get older, it gets harder to tour and play shows and all that stuff, but it sounds like you're still very into it. I'm so into it. Um, I love it. Um, and I feel very, very lucky that I still get to do music. I don't know. I don't think I would be a happy person if, if I didn't, if I wasn't able to still do this. Yeah. I'm with you on that. You know, I, if I didn't have some kind of creative outlet, which I didn't for a long time, I would be in big trouble, which I was for a long time. But, you know, between this and music I work on now, it's like there's no shortage of things to produce. That's what I need. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that it's uh, glad that you have that. So you getting started in movie life, that's pretty incredible. And I like that you you just faked it until you made it, you know, like you're just like, yeah, I did this and you and you went into it and you did it. Yeah. Yeah, really. I mean, the the ambition was there was two things that made me ambitious where I wasn't like I didn't have a choice like I knew I want I knew I needed it one the first time I toured I was like holy shit this is this is it and and we were playing small shows to nobody but I was you know I was on the road I was out there I was seeing the country that I had only seen on TV so I knew I needed that and that was the way I wanted to do things I always wanted to be traveling making friends, meeting people, seeing, seeing beauty. And, um, yeah, pretty. And, and I mean, the other thing is just once I started writing, I knew I needed it. I knew that it was going to help me. You know, there were no other, there were no other goals. Maybe the goal of playing on Long Island and having like 10 of your friends moshing and singing along. That was probably, (laughs) that was probably it, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, where it's taken me in all the various, all the various things I've done throughout my career is like, it's, it's very special. And I do not take it for granted at all. I love that. Yeah. So how did you get from Long Island to getting out and touring in the world? Tell us some of the story. Well, once the movie life started playing shows on Long Island, we started playing weekends away, like we'd go to Vermont, and we go to New Jersey and Massachusetts and North Carolina. And we all kind of started to take the band pretty seriously. And I do remember we were like, okay, so we're going to need a van. So I remember I was working in a batting range. Everybody had like a job. We would pay like 50 bucks a week or something. Maybe not a week. We would pay some sort of band dues into like a shoebox kind of like every week or every month. and. That money, when it came time and when we were ready, like help put a down payment on a van. So we were, we were driven, you know what I mean? Like we, we weren't just like, oh, I hope this falls into our lap. Like once we realized that we really wanted to, you know, after playing a show on Long Island, the next goal was we should do a tour. And once we all got that bug up our ass, we were like, okay, we're going to need a van. And we, we kind of like, you know, we took it seriously and made sacrifices to go on our first tour. And we did our, we were kind of lucky in that respect. Our first tour, we supported our other friends from Long Island. They were called Inside. They had toured before and they had a seven inch out on a label uh, in California. So that was like the ultimate destination. We would get to California, play a bunch of shows, come back. Um, So we did like a three week tour of the United States. We probably played like 12 shows in three weeks. There was lots of off days. There was like, you know, cancellations, things that happen in a DIY situation where nobody really knows the bands that are playing. But it was like, you know, such an eye opening experience for me. It it, a a life affirming experience where I was like, okay, I need more of this, you know. So after that, we, you know, we had our van, uh, we did, we did that, uh, we did that tour in a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, but when we did, we got a van and, um, started doing our own stuff, um, going and playing with bands that 
you know, trading shows. You come to Long Island, we'll come to your city, you know, we'll headline for you, you headline for us, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, we just started hooking up with people. We didn't have a booking agent yet. So we would hook up with people from other scenes and put together a routing and tour everywhere. And all the while sending our music to every indie label under the sun, getting rejected constantly. <laughs> um, and we, let's see, we, 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 we didn't have a booking agent for a while. Um, so we just did it all on, on our own. The, I would say one of the, there's like a few things that happened that kind of w- brought us to a new level. One, we recorded a record called It's Go Time in like two days, which is like a full length record, our first full length record. Our friends paid for it. They had a label on Long Island. They helped us out to get onto the road. They were called Fade Away Records. They helped us get on the road for real, um, touring on this record. And we sent that record to a label called Deep Elm. Um, oh, yeah, I remember them. Yeah, like they were doing, they had some bands that we admired. And also they, this is back when compilations were a very effective tool and a, yep. and a very big part of how people got into music. Deep Elm declined to sign the band, but they did put one of our songs on one of their Emo Diaries compilations. A few things happened with that. So that led to Jason Upright at Revelation Records, who was at Revelation Records, who signed us to Revelation. He heard our song on there, and then he got the record, and then he came and saw us play in front of nobody. And he saw that we were working hard, really touring, and making a grassroots following now. Like There was people coming to see us here and there. We were noticing people in other cities and other parts of the country a few of them, maybe a dozen, and then a few dozen, and then snowballing into like, oh shit, people know the words. People are actually coming to see us. Yeah. Um, Jason took notice and took kind of took a chance um, on Movie Life, and we signed to Revelation, went in with Brian McTurnan, made a record called This Time Next Year, and I do remember Jason being like, wow (laughs) and us being like well what he's like i I mean i like you guys and stuff but i didn't think you were you would make a record like this until maybe your next record you know what i mean like wow that's high praise yeah so when we handed in that record he was like oh there's definitely something here so yeah i mean that record was really 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 important it really we broke through They had worldwide distribution. So there were people in other countries that knew our name. Uh, Even if they didn't know our music, they knew our name because of Revelation and like them being such a huge part of punk and hardcore um, with their discography. And even, you know, when we signed there, our label mates were like, it was very like Game Face, um, the Judas Factor, Fast Break, In My Eyes. Elliot, uh, Drowning Man. So th- it's from like heavy m- metal, hardcore kind of stuff to like indie rock stuff. So we got in there and we were kind of this, you know, when we signed to Rev, things got a little edgier, a little more punk and hardcore influenced. Not that we were ever a hardcore band, but like we were hardcore kids. So that record just kind of, that record immediately was like, now we have a now we have a booking agent. Now there's bands asking us to open their tours. Um, we're playing in front of a lot of people or more people than we were used to off of Long Island. And things were definitely set in motion there. Yeah, it's probably hard to see it at the time because you're in the middle of it. But year 2000, Revelation Records, the scene was blowing up. You're recording with Brian McTurnan, who has recorded all of my favorite bands. Uh, has recorded so many classic records, your, yours included. I mean, it's just, it's all it's all lining up. It's all happening. And I like that you said, you know, you realized peop- no one was going to hand it to you. Like you guys just went out there and you kept doing the work, even through rejection and everything else. I mean, that's something I didn't learn till much later. Like when I think back on my first band, I'm like, I wasn't out there like grinding, trying to get shows or 
emailing people or reaching out or doing any work. I was just kind of showing up and playing. So I, I mean, talking to you and so many other musicians now, I can see those are the things you got to do. You got to get out there and, you know, get in front of people, however you can do it. Absolutely. And obviously, I mean, it, it's, it works differently these days, but back then that was really it. You tour, you get in front. It, it It's kind of nice when, you know, a label's not just going to come and see you play. They might. No. Who knows? Like one of their friends, one of their, you know, brings you to a show. And But the fact that you can't just send people your music, you need to kind of also be like, oh, and we're going to be in town in like two weeks. Like, oh, shit, you're going to be in Southern California? Like, yep. Yeah. Because we're we're in it. Like, we're doing it. We're touring. Yeah. The blind sending of things isn't typically how things work. It's like there's a connection or you know somebody or you work your way up to the point where like you're on somebody's radar. Exactly. Um, so it's super helpful to be grinding at the same time. And labels back then, they would notice. Labels now, <laughs> how many how many Instagram followers do you have? How many Spotify plays do you have? It's like, yo, aren't you a record label? <laughs> we will have the Instagram followers and the Spotify plays after you do your job. <laughs> so that that kind of shit is is I see it because I work, you know, I help other bands and like I produce music from time to time and I try to send it to people and like get people interested on a grassroots level. Like, hey, why don't you sign this band? Because this record's fucking awesome and you know it. Yeah. <laughs> Not like <laughs> this band, these guys are huge on TikTok. It's like that shit. I know that that's how it works and I don't mean to sound like an old fuck, but like that's whack. Yeah. That's whack. I mean, if you're a record label and you believe in yourself and you believe in the music and your ability to get people into this music while they're doing their work and touring and doing the shit that bands need to do, shouldn't matter how many TikTok followers or fucking Instagram followers, that'll come after you make the band popular. Otherwise, what are you doing? <laughs> like, wh why, why, why should, why should anyone sign to your label? You know what I mean? Exactly. I think both sides have to be doing the work. Like the band has to be out there and have somewhat of a following and really be doing it. And people have to be interested. And then the label can take them to the next level. You know, like, uh, before I partnered with a label, I was doing a show every week. I was making it look and sound the absolute best that I could. And then the label gets involved and they take it to the next level. That's the way it should work. Things are happening, right? You ended up on drive through and that was the path back then. You you get on drive through and then you get on, uh, what was their subsidy or what was the one that owned them, MCA or RCA or yeah, something? Yeah, MCA. Yeah, and then, then, then you're off to the races. Well, yeah, um, the whole drive through thing, they, we, we played a few shows with Newfound Glory and with... Um, Midtown and we became friends with those bands and drive we became on drive throughs radar for sure. They wanted drive through came up like flat out and we're like, we, we want you. And we, had, we were signed to rev. We kept it real. We were like, no, like we're happy where we are. You know, maybe we could talk in the future, but like right now we're concentrating on this record and we just want to tour and we want to, you know, this time next year was definitely doing something. People were buying it. People were getting into it. There was a pretty pivotal moment there where drive through would be constantly knocking on the door. Um, and we were, we were happy where we were until we weren't. We, we were doing a bunch of work, a lot of, a lot of touring, a lot of traveling. I would say a pivotal moment was having, we had a van wreck in South Dakota where we all survived and with a few broken bones and stitches and things like that but like we needed a new van we basically the, the thing that we were doing with our lives now we couldn't do it anymore we didn't have a van our trailer was smashed our van was smashed uh some of our gear got smashed we were kind of fucked and there was no go fund me you know what i'm saying so yeah we were just kind of like maybe we should listen to what drive through has to say <laughs> um and that's kind of part of how that happened. I felt like we were, our ambition was, you know, we started becoming even more ambitious and we started setting new goals. And I think signing to a label that with that kind of reach and with those kind of resources was definitely interesting to us. The fact that we needed a new gear, a new van, new trailer, all that shit was part of it. So when we talked to them, we we're like, we need all this stuff. And they're like, yep. 
cool. <laughs> It's like, why not? It's either that or go on a three-year hiatus to save money or like end the band. Exactly. So, um, and we were at the same time, we were interested in like what was going on over there. I mean, their roster was exploding. Every band, there was a real culture around the, around the label. Like, you know, it, there still happens to this day every once in a while with a label where, you know, I'm a fan of this label, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's yeah. the way it was back then. As soon as we signed, like before we even put music out, you know, drive through bought a few thousand of our revelation record through their distro and like sold it on their website. Hey, this band that we just signed has this record out. And it wasn't all like, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, we're going to drive through now. Drive through had to buy out our contract. Revelation was very happy. They got a bunch of money and they still own the record that was still performing and making money for them. We got a new label, new van, new trailer, new gear. And like, yeah, got paid for the first time. It got like an advance. <laughs> so th <laughs> things that, things that, um, you know, we hadn't made a dime off the band. We were paying to be in the band. So when we started the drive through, I do remember being like, oh, cool. Wait, so we're getting paid. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, pretty soon after that, we went in to record our first drive through release, um, which was The Movie Life Has a Gambling Problem, which is like extremely, extremely pop punk sounding, um, which was a little bit of a departure from our This Time Next Year stuff, a little bit less of an edge. And like the tempos were up, but things were a little more pop punkish. Was that a conscious choice? I don't remember it being a conscious choice, but I think the proof is in the pudding. I think we signed to drive through and we thought we needed to sound a certain way. Yeah. Um, just like going back and listening to it, you you know, even if I told you no, no, absolutely not. Even if it was subconsciously like that, that happened, you know? Yeah. I've always been curious. Does anyone in the movie life actually have a gambling problem or is it just a record title? We were gambling a lot and uh, <laughs> we, we would gamble a lot like like in the van and like backstage and shit. And then but once we started touring, we would end up in Vegas and stuff. We were like, wow, not that we had any money, but we were just like, oh, this is cool. This is fun. And once we did start making money, I mean, we all still live with our parents and stuff. We were young. So like it, it was no problem to go gamble if you don't have any bills to pay <laughs> and we didn't have cell phones and shit like this is before everybody had cell phones so we had like one band phone that we would like share oh god i i remember that now I, I remember the band i used to tour with had a band phone and there would always be arguments about people calling their girlfriends too much or <laughs> who was using it and who wasn't it was a whole thing <laughs> oh god yeah yeah the band ends up disbanding in 2003 right what happens i mean you're on drive through things are picking up we're touring we're doing it right this is the dream um so yeah so we're we're touring i mean we released our biggest record after gambling problem called 40 hour train back to Penn. so we released that in early 2003 and we go like we're away all year like all year achieving new heights you know, headlining these rooms that we were opening in and, you know, milestones like headlining Irving Plaza in New York City was a milestone on that, on touring for that record. Um, we were yeah. definitely growing and getting bigger and becoming more successful um, and getting really fucking sick of each other. Um, <laughs> we were guys that started the band like five or six years before that um, with different goals. And now we were growing up and coming into our own styles and becoming our own people. And I don't know, I, I I truly feel like the movie life was like a bunch of people who got put into a situation together. And then it took off because of the work we put into it. And towards the end, we were just like, I don't, some of us just weren't even friends, you know, and life on the road can be hard when you're not getting along. And when people are pulling it one way and another guy's pulling it another way. And so we, it got to a point we were touring in like September of 2003 when the band was at its biggest, it got to a point where nobody was talking to me in the band and we were in a van. So it's kind of awkward. <laughs> yeah. um, so we had a little bit of an incident at a show in Pittsburgh where there was a little flare up and, and 
Was it between you and the band or like the band and the crowd? What yeah, was the flare me, up? me and the band. So we were playing, uh, we were playing a big show, like the biggest show we'd ever headlined in Pittsburgh. There was probably like five or 600 people there in the, in a club that we opened for like 10 bands in. So it was like, you know, it was like a nice feeling to be like, Oh, we're the headliner now. Um, and the crowd wanted another song and they wanted to go out and play like something new or something. And I was like, no, like we need to give them what they want. And so I was like, we're going to play this song. And they're like, no. So I just walk on stage and I was like, all right, we're going to play this song. And the band reluctantly got on stage to play the song that they didn't want to play. Uh, and they all turned their backs to their amp. Like they all faced their amps and just played the, like went through the motions of playing and didn't look at the crowd or myself or anything. And that was their, Ooh. that was their protest, their mutiny. Um, and so we had it out the next day. We had a long talk. Everybody agreed that we want to break up. We finished that tour and it was actually very relieving to have the talk. Um, yeah. After the talk, it was all nice again. People were like, just, the tension was broken. Everyone got there, you know, I, nobody argued. I would, I would say within 30 seconds, everybody was like, we should break up, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Next thing we know, we break up. Our last show is at the Worcester Palladium at a festival. I agreed that we would, we all agreed that we would make an announcement online after the tour was over. So obviously I got on stage and in the last song, I said, this is the last song you're ever going to see us play live. And the crowd was like, huh? Because there was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people there to see us. And then let's see, that was probably on a Saturday and that Monday morning. I mean, I knew we were breaking up like a week or two before that show. So I had already set up a job. I like got my, uh, that Monday morning I was on a construction site. Wow. Yeah. In, in two days from touring the world to working construction. Yep. Loading a dumpster. How did you feel? I mean, were you, it sounds like there was a lot of tension, obviously, and I'm sure everybody was happy to be over that, but were you just shell shocked going so quickly from one thing to the other? Yeah. Yeah. It sucked. It really sucked. I was at this construction site for like two months too. And it was in like, it was in Brooklyn. I was living on Long Island. Um, it it sucked, dude. Um, <laughs> I'm not a construction site kind of guy. Yeah, I would last five minutes. I think. I, I'm. I, I. I mean, I'm down with manual labor and stuff, but like, I didn't have any skills either. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I didn't know how to do anything, so I was just doing the grunt work, like loading dumpsters. Uh, and they were started teaching me things, and I was like. I don't care about this. Like, this isn't my thing. I don't like this. I'm not going to be good at this. So honestly, like that whole thing, two things happened right around that time. One, I joined Head Automatica as a rhythm guitar player. And two, I started writing my own music. Yeah. Now, these are some things I want to ask about you. First, Head Automatica. That must have been great. How did that come about? Because Glassjaw just exploded in 2002. They were they were the band everybody looked up to, uh, at least in my circle, and I'm sure many others. So it was just, it was just unbelievable that they didn't keep going and put out more records until much later. So, what was it like? How did you get connected with them, and what were those shows like? The way I got into it is, I mean, Daryl and I were best friends, and I he knew what was going on with the movie life, and he was like, "Why don't you come play in Head Automatica?" Because Head Automatica was something that he was making. He was making a record, yeah. you know, before anybody knew who they were or that a record was being made. So I joined before anybody really knew about Head on a Mac or before a record was out. So what that entailed was basically just becoming a band, like rehearsing a lot, getting to know the music, delegating responsibilities, harmonies, like who's playing this, who's playing that. A lot of that was done in San Francisco because half of the band was San Francisco people. Half of them were like East Coast people. So that was amazing time in my life. Like I, I, I quit the construction job. We hung out in San Francisco for like a month at a time sometimes. Um, we were getting paid per diems from the label, which was a major. Um, so we, we were kind of just hanging out in this bohemian musical thing, like having fun. Um, a bunch of us were straight edge for a, a decent portion of our life. And that was coming to an end as well in San Francisco. <laughs> we started enjoying 
uh, the wonders of nature. And yes, we, uh, that, so that was happening. So I played two shows in head automatica before I left the band and pursued. I'm the avalanche. Mm -hmm. Uh, we played at Spaceland in LA, um, which was really fun and really cool. And people did come out because it was like people that would come out to glass show shows or movie life shows, like people that knew me and Daryl. And Josh, who was playing in American Nightmare, and Larry, who was playing in Glassjaw, and of course, Dan the Automator, who produced the record, was like in the band too at the time. So, and his guys, Jim and Brandon, who were like playing in bands that we admired, like I saw them play in Lovage with Mike Patton, and there was all this Bay Area stuff that we were collaborating with a bunch of interesting people. So we played at Spaceland. I remember that night we partied really fucking hard. Met Paris Hilton, met, uh, <laughs> like we just got off stage and went to like whatever club that we were supposed to go to, you know, like Kelly Osborne was DJing. We ended up, uh, you know, burning the midnight oil because we were party, party, party boys. And, uh, that same night I remember bribing the, we, we bribed the desk guy at the hotel on sunset that we were staying at and let us go to the pool. We threw a pool party and the dudes from Maroon 5 walked in and they were like friendly. And then I realized that we had met at the border in Canada because both of us, were, when Maroon 5 was in a van in a trailer yeah, and Movie Life was in a van in a trailer, we bonded over being held up at the border. So we just sat there together for hours while they looked for non-existent drugs in our van. <laughs> So those guys showed up that night. Anyway, crazy night. And then the, the second night was also crazy. This The only other show I played in Head Automatica was at Sundance Film Festival in, wow. in um, Park City, Utah. So we played the Flaunt Magazine party, <laughs> like this very cool, like fashion-y party. Um, I remember the editor of the magazine with a huge bag of Coke. It was the first time I ever seen cocaine before. <laughs> while we're playing just slaps the bag of coke up on the stage <laughs> did anyone take it <laughs> no i would have grabbed it like a hungry dog back in those days <laughs> uh i've still never snorted anything in my life so i'm very ha very happy to report that but um you you know what you're better off because uh let's just say i've dabbled i've done my share and your share and his share and everyone's share and well n now i can't do anything anymore so right done okay. over that's good <laughs> Um, yeah, so I remember that. And then I, and then I got alcohol poisoning <laughs> because oh, we were, we were just learning how to not be straight edge, you know? Yeah. And we were, we were partying and I learned real fast, like really, really fast. Like, oh no, you can't do that. Like, okay. Shit. And did you learn, like, did you, did you learn limits or was there a lot of up and down? Yeah. I mean, when I stopped being straight edge, I, my, I wasn't really that interested in drinking. I was, I wanted to smoke weed. Yeah. I knew that it was my thing. I just knew that. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely went through some experimental times, a very, very brief experimental period as far as any other drugs that aren't just weed and alcohol. Um, yeah. I experimented a little bit and kind of just, yeah, I, I didn't, there was still a straight edge kid in me who was like, You're not, don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, so, which is why that, you know, I made myself a promise. Like as soon as I stopped being straight edge, I made myself a promise that I would never snort anything or, and, and anything, you know, nothing like that. So, so you just injected everything instead. <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I just wouldn't mess around with hard drugs. So the time that I ended up being on hard drugs as a result of like taking like designer drugs, you know what I mean? Um, like party stuff. So like that kind of shit, I had a very, very, very brief interaction with and learned really fast that it wasn't for me. So that's good. Yeah. Like I, I don't, I guess <sighs> I've been lucky where one, I didn't want to feel that way. Some people's bodies do want to feel that way. And that, and, and that's tough when that's your thing. My body was like, nah. And that's the same with, I had to, I ended up having to take like, it was about a five month period of my life where I had to take Percocet every day because I severely injured my back. 
And to be able to even get out of bed, I had to take these really strong pills. And I had to take like three a day. The blue ones? I don't remember. I remember I couldn't shit for five months though. Um, Yeah, that's part of it. So I got lucky with that too, because I needed, I was very, I, I was very grateful that those drugs were there for me when I was hurt, but I was very worried about getting off of them. And I was definitely addicted to oxycodone and uh i got lucky there too you know like the those pills would make me feel sick they would take the pain away or help with the pain um that i was dealing with in my body but like they made me feel sick i would say i felt comfort for like an hour but like the other five or six hours would be like i just felt sick nauseous um so my i don't i don't have like a inclination towards those kind of drugs either and I'm feel, I feel very lucky about that too, because I know a lot of people aren't so lucky with that, where they they really do want that, you know, and they and they enjoy it and it makes them feel good. And I get that. I get that from drinking beer and whiskey. Like that makes me feel good. That's yeah. you know, and I try to I try my best to, you know, just not let everything anything become everything you know what i mean that's uh i like that i uh, that's those are smart choices to make and you know getting into stuff later probably helped you make smarter choices me like i did something and i was like i'm just gonna do this every day for as many days as i can or even with stuff like opiates and that kind of thing i hated them they made me feel like crap but i kept doing them until I like them, which seems pretty stupid in retrospect. Yeah, that's like that's like cigarettes. It's like nobody's enjoyed their first cigarette. They just work at it, and then they, <laughs> you know what I mean. I did that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, but I know I consider myself lucky that I never got caught up in in drugs in that way. And I and some of it is willpower, and some of it is just promises I made to myself. But other. There's definitely other factors like I don't like opiates, thank God. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Because I don't know, like my mom, I remember my mom being pretty concerned because she knew that I had to take these pills and I was touring and stuff. So I was like, that that was a thing. Like on tour, I would take a Percocet just so that I could sit in the van comfortably. And then I would take another one. And then by the time the show started, I was not on Percocet anymore. Because I couldn't do the shows on Percocet. Like, I was just too, like, spacey. So um, I would just tough my way through it. Like, I couldn't even bend over to, like, plug my guitar into my pedal. Like, you know what I mean? Like, my friend would help me. (laughs) Wow. So, yeah. And so that was, yeah, that was, uh, I don't know how we got on that. You said you were on it for five months. When you stopped, did you have to, like, detox at all? Were you, was was it like that? What I started doing was I started waning myself off of it. So I would take a half instead of a whole, or I would take, you know, two in a day instead of three in a day. And then I would take one and a half per day. And then one, it, it, that, that was coinciding with, you know, basically when I had the injury, the guy was like, listen, like your nerves all fucked in six months, you're going to be at least in like, like naturally the pain will subside, not fully. But so right around that time that it started subsiding is when I started weaning myself off of it so that I I didn't have some kind of withdrawals. And like, I was very conscious. I was, I stayed on top of myself big time with the opiates because, you know, I mean, I I see what kind of havoc that has wreaked on so many families, so many people, friends that I've lost, friends that friends have lost. Yeah. Um, I was, that was not going to be me, so. Yeah. And smart, smart to see that and just like start cutting down. Yeah. Well, luckily the pain started going down too. So that, that was helpful. So those two things happening at the same time, me being on top of it and, and, and cutting down as the inflammation started to go down was, was very, very fortuitous for me. That's good. Yeah. And you know, it's pretty incredible. Like you're in head automatica writing and touring. People are slapping bags of Coke on the stage while you're playing. You're playing Sundance. Uh, You're hobnobbing (laughs) with Paris Hilton and uh, Maroon 5. And you you leave to start your own band. Now, here's what I'm imagining. Now, when I played music, I always needed to move on to the next thing. When I played bass, I needed to write on guitar. When I wrote on guitar, I needed to write the song. When I wrote the song, I needed to sing. I needed to do all of the things. So I think regardless of the situation, I was going to have to work up to that point. Did you feel the same way? 
Yeah. So being in a head automatica was amazing. It was an amazing part of my life. Um, me leaving the band was beneficial for them. And for me, I did not need to be the rhythm guitar player in my best friend's band. I did not need to have him be the boss. What I needed to do was write my own stuff. Movie life, I always wrote the vocals and melodies over music. I am the avalanche, you know, which I, I left and, and pursued I am the avalanche. This was me writing for the first time. So like, the first I Am The Avalanche record is me writing songs for the first first time by myself. So how was that? Extremely liberating, especially I had just started smoking weed and like getting real creative and trying to make something that didn't sound like the movie life. And I think I succeeded in that, um, especially with that first record. Things were things were the way I wanted them to be, and it was extremely rewarding. I put together a band of great guys and great musicians. You know, even though the movie life broke up, tensions were eased. And like, you know, Brandon, who was one of the songwriting guys in movie life, like he helped me put together the Avalanche demo. So I put together a demo and I put, I put together the band like with that being like, this is what it's like. What do you think? And yeah, Brandon from movie life like came in and helped me track guitars and is, is cool. So the transition into Avalanche was uh, extremely liberating. I enjoyed my time in San Francisco. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I would even say that cramming for guitar for Head Automatica really, really helped me become a better guitar player. I think Daryl in general, like, you know, his help early on with like, you know, the faking me writing my first song for Movie Life and the work in Head Automatica as far as guitar stuff, like those are like, yeah, Daryl, I mean he's he's definitely a part of the story for sure there's no denying that yeah i mean you guys are friends like i have friends i looked up to who helped me write and helped me figure out the band thing or being out on tour i would just look at what other bands did and copy what they do it's all it's all part of the process oh dude even if you jam with someone even if you even if you hang with someone like and jam and drink a few beers with somebody there might be one chord that they play and you and you're like oh shit and then you pick that chord up and it becomes part of your arsenal. And like, you know, you, you do all you, these new chord phrasings around this whole new thing that you didn't do. So that kind of stuff, I, I, any sort of creative jamming experience or band experience, you pick st stuff up from everybody and you carry it with you. Absolutely. Yeah. My friend who I used to co-host this show with showed me this open chord that I never knew. And I used that to write one of my favorite songs I've written in my first band where I wrote like everything, you know, because I, I started in bands when I was 24, but I didn't do a band that I fronted and put together until I was 35. Oh, wow. So yeah, and it was just, it was the best experience ever because for the first time I'm writing the songs, I'm writing the music. It's like my vision as opposed to me trying to cram my vision into what everyone else is doing. So, I mean, when you did that in I am the avalanche and you're doing this for the first time, it must've been the greatest feeling. Such a good feeling. I'm very proud of the first avalanche record. It's uh, it's a really nice snapshot of like a, a, a place in time in my life for sure. How was it touring being back out and playing with avalanche and getting back out there? So fun. Such a great group of guys. Everybody had the same mission, which was travel and have fun. <laughs> Touring for the first time, not being straight edge was interesting. A <laughs> um, lot of beers, a lot of shots of whiskey, yeah. a lot of joints. Avalanche is a straight up party band. Like not all the music reflected that, but when at a show, it would always just be like, like the 30 pack on the rider was gone before uh, the show, before doors opened. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, we, 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 I mean, Avalanche has made some cool shit. We have a really cool, kind of worldwide loyal fan base that are down. We've made some records we're really proud of. We have seen the world a million times over with each other and have like the greatest memories and and we still get to do it sometimes. Yeah, cuz you guys continued putting out records and you know, you had a release in 2020 so you still do it sometimes, right? We still do it and when we play shows they're great. Um they're very few and far between, so when we do it people come out and yeah, it's, 
it's it's very cool. The avalanche, um, my avalanche experience has been like, yeah, it, it's insane. Movie life was never a band of brothers. Um, avalanche is a band, like exactly. That's exactly what avalanche is. Uh, yeah. Even some of the guys don't tour with us anymore, but they still come and play on the records and they, you know what I mean? Like we still hang and we, you know, we, it's a, it's very much a family vibe. Um, but you know, that, that it's old guy shit. It's your classic old guy shit. You're, you can't, not everybody can tour anymore. Not everybody can do it like we used to do it. So that's natural. But yeah, we always keep it real tight and family with, with Avalanche. I love that. Yeah. And that's the way it goes. I mean, with the first band you're in, it's usually situational or just whoever's around kind of, and not that it's not a good experience or that you make friends through it, but then like with the, with the later bands, you're established and you can kind of piece it together with who you want. Yeah, exactly. Um, putting together a band of like, you know, throughout my touring years, like some, it didn't happen with all of them, but like two of the guys like are from bands I toured with. So like I would make these mental notes, like, Oh yeah, this guy's sick and I like him a lot and he's a good player. And so, yeah, that was um, very, very, very special. And I love the way it all worked out. Everyone and I in the avalanche, aside from Mike and rat who like hung out in Florida together in their younger years, they all met each other at the first practice. Oh, really? Yeah. And that band toured the world together for like a long time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> With no member changes. And the, and the only time cha- members change is not because people hate each other. It's because pe- people have to do other shit and with their other, with their career and all, you know what I mean? Yeah. Careers, kids, you know, you get older, priorities change. So you do solo work as well. Let's talk about this. When did you get started? How did you get started? And was it scary? You know, like I, I played one solo acoustic show in my life and I think it went terribly. I mean, I'm sure if I put the work in, I could get to a point where I was comfortable. But how was it for you? I wasn't very good at it in the beginning. Um, I had never really played guitar in front of anybody before. <laughs> yeah. Um, I knew I liked it. I liked the freedom of it. I didn't have solo material the first bunch of show. I would play just movie life and avalanche songs and maybe like a few covers. So I was busy with avalanche. So like when I would play, when I would play solo shows, I would just do that. It would just be me solo, but playing my band's music. So after a little while, I was like, okay, I need to like write my own stuff. It's weird. Like it's hard to know what your solo stuff's supposed to sound like. If it's an acoustic guitar, it's like, okay, I'm doing a folk punk thing right? Yeah. Which is fine. I don't really listen to that kind of music. I don't really, you know? Um, yeah. So the first release, I'm I'm super proud of all the solo stuff I've done and it all means something to me and it's all even more personal. But yeah, like the first one I was like, okay, I'm doing the wicka 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 like punk thing, punk folk <laughs> acoustic thing. The second time I'm like, fuck it, I'm just going to make a full uh that was called city by the sea and then the next time i was like all right i'm gonna make a full fucking band record there's there are no rules here i'm gonna tour with a band they're gonna back me i did that that was very expensive i couldn't afford to have a pay a band to like come play solo shows with me (laughs) Um, did you have to pay a band did you have to like hire people yeah i mean i i had friends like I had a I had a sick band of really good musicians, but yeah, these are adults that need to get paid. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it's not like when you're a kid and you can be like, "Hey, we're, my solo band is going to go tour. Let's go." It'd be like, "Yeah, Whoa. you get a free trip around the country." <laughs> <laughs> What's in it for me? Yeah. Um. So now I and I, then then I made a another EP called Aging Frontman. The other one was called Survivor's Guilt, the full band one. It was more stripped down on on uh, aging front man, um, and then I'm actually making a record right now as we speak. I got back last night from the studio, and like I was saying, and like I'm back on like a no rules thing. I just want to make good songs and put them on a record, not like yeah, but am I going to be able to play this live or am I going to? No, no, no. Life's short. Make these songs that you want to make. You'll figure it out. 
So that's what I'm doing. And there's definitely no rules whatsoever. I, I'm not going to be like rapping on my new record, but like <laughs> I'm definitely doing whatever I want because what, you know, what imaginary rules am I following? You know what I mean? Exactly. You could do a folk punk thing if you want. You could do a full band thing if you want. You could do like a solemn acoustic song if you want. Why not? I think that'll all be in there. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I think if I was going to do a solo record, I probably would just copy Beck C change and oh, try God. to make like so really sad, soulful music. So good. Um, yeah. You know, he made like another one like that. What was that one called? He made like another. Let me look. I got my phone right here. Yeah, look it up because if there's anything else like Sea Change, I need to hear it. There is. He put out a record that was meant to be like the companion to Sea Change. Yeah. Or you know, like he went and made a few more funky records, and then he went back to. Um, it's called Morning Phase. It's amazing. I gotta listen to that. I'm gonna do that today. I'm gonna listen to it today too. I haven't listened to it in years. It's really good. Speaking of uh, other music that isn't ours or yours, I, I was uh, researching about you and you mentioned Jets to Brazil, Perfecting Loneliness. And you said this record will really make you feel good about feeling bad. And I'm happy to read about someone else who loves that band and that record especially because I go back to it all the time. You know, I, I didn't catch the Jawbreaker reunions, but if there was a Jets to Brazil reunion, I can guarantee you. I would be there. I think that's a underappreciated and wonderful band. Absolutely agree. I don't care if I hear Jawbreaker ever again, if it means that I can see Jets to Brazil once. Yes. That doesn't mean that Jawbreaker didn't make one of the finest punk records of all time. They did. And I did go, I did go to see the, I, I went like a few years ago when they first reformed. Oh, nice. Yeah, I like Jawbreaker, but I don't know. Jets to Brazil just speaks to my soul more. Lyrically, it's like some of it's some of the best lyrics ever. Oh yeah, ever. I don't. I can't think of a better. I would say that Blake in his Jets to Brazil era is probably the best lyricist of all time. I would agree with you. Top three for sure. I've never thought about who my favorites are, but he's up there for for Jets to Brazil, like a hundred percent. God, I hope they do. A sh- I hope they do some shows. I don't they think we're the to. only ones. I think there's a lot of people that would come out of the woodwork for that. Yeah. How about the song Psalm? That's crazy good. Oh, dude. Yeah. It's funny that I hadn't listened to Perfecting Loneliness in a few years, probably because I I, I get I I always listen to Jets. But I like keep I like to keep it fresh. So like I'll go in phases where I like, all right, I'm back in arm orange rhyming dictionary land. Yeah. I'm hanging out here. All right, cool. Yeah. Six months later, I'm like, all right, you know what? Four corner night is pretty fucking good. Let's listen to that. <laughs> um but yeah, rat we were just we did a few movie live shows and and uh perfecting loneliness came on in the van and we listened to the whole thing front to back and was just like, Woo! It's perfect. It's not perfect. There's a few songs that I, that's what that. So people aren't rhyming dictionary is a 10 out of 10, in my opinion. Yeah. Four cornered night might have one or two skippable songs for me at least. Yeah. And so people, I, I know a lot of people that are like, Oh no, I was out after orange rhyming. That's it. I'm like, you're nuts. The, the other records aren't as good. And I'm like, I guess you could say there aren't as many good songs on the on the other two records. Like there's not like 12 out of 12 perfect songs, but some of Jester Brazil's best songs are on those le- later two records. Yeah, I think it's crazy to just cut them off after Orange Rhyming Dictionary because so- my favorite songs on those other two records are so good. It would just be crazy to to just dismiss them. We were talking about Cat Heaven. When that came on, I was like, this has to be in the top three best Jet songs. Same for, um, fuck, there's a few other ones on that record. And Four Corner Night, too. Yeah, you, The Frequency, You're the One I Want. Yeah. I mean, come on. Like, these are these are some of their best songs they've ever written. Yeah. Wishlist is, is one that popped out the other day to me where I was like, oh, this is really great, too. I love all the piano stuff. The yeah. lyrics, the lyrics only got better, and I, you know, he seemed to be in a pretty sad place when he wrote that record. Yes, well, you know, I can relate to that because I used to be a sad sack all the time. Not anymore, but there was many years of that. Yeah, I mean, I like to be, I like to feel those feelings. I don't want to be 
sad. I don't want my life to be a sad thing. But So, Vinny, let's talk about what we've got coming up. Now, you are recording. Is this a new solo LP? So I went in. I, I called up Brett, who I do everything with. He plays in Movie Life and Avalanche with me as well. He's a great producer. Makes a lot of big records these days. I was just like, hey, you got a few days for me? And he's like, yeah, come in. Let's do it. Let's go. I had no... My mission was just to record the few songs that I had. And I'm kind of on a roll. I definitely feel like I am. Things are going the way I want them to go. I'm finishing songs that I may have put on pause. Um, I'm going back to all the things that never really left me. Like, you know, those songs that when they just have something, I'm working on all of those songs. And I have four recorded now in a crazy sick studio with awesome production and I've only, we've only worked for four days. So I think by the time, I think before like winter, I mean, I'm going to get busy. He's busy with records. I think that I'll be done with a full length worth of music, whether it's going to be released in that format. I have no idea, but I'm going to have a full length worth of solo stuff by like, probably like September or something. Nice. October. Yeah. Um, so it's coming. We don't know exactly what it is or how it will be released yet, but it is coming. No, yeah, and I don't. I like. I'm a free agent. I don't have a label. Like it's kind of kind of cool. Like this is not like, hey, when are you making a new record? Because you have to, you know, you're signed to the label and this and that. It's just me making. It's me making a record because I want to, and I'll figure out everything else. But for now, I'm just trying to make the best record I've ever made. I like that. And you can do it on your terms because there's no deadline rush or any of that stuff like that you would have with a label. He's going, he's making a record starting this week. I I think yesterday when I left the studio, he's like, he's like, cool. So like maybe in like a month we'll do it again. I'm like, cool. I was like, I'll have two or three more ready to go. And at that point, we'll probably need one more session after that. And then I'm, I'm going to have a full length. It's coming like that right now. And I'm really, really happy with it. I just need to not fuck it up. (laughs) <laughs> and that that's my whole like i'm what i mean is like lose my drive for it or slack off on the creative process i have to put the hours in and if i do that then i'm gonna get the product that i want you know the end result that i want which is putting out a record and having certain people in the world go fuck yeah this is my shit <laughs> that's it <laughs> like that's it and just write great songs so i'm just trying to write great songs and when I write something cool on guitar, I just try not to fuck it up with vocals. Gotta, <laughs> gotta do the right thing over, write the right words, write the right melodies, have it be pure, have it be organic, have it not be forced. And uh, that's working out great so far. So I'm just going to keep on with that. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And how about Avalanche and uh, Movie Life? Any any plans for the future? Um Movie Life just played a few shows this past weekend. I'm sure there are going to be some more shows coming up for the Movie Life. It is the 20th anniversary of 40 Hour Train Back to Penn next year. So maybe we could do something around that. Avalanche, I told Mikey to start writing some guitar stuff. We're definitely keen on doing another record. But we have like eight shows booked for this year that we haven't announced yet, which is a lot for Avalanche. <laughs> so. Uh, we're going to be playing some shows, some in July and then some in uh, in uh, September. And we'll be writing a record like me and Michael will slowly start writing a record like throughout this year into the next year. Yeah. Awesome. Whatever band it is of yours that people are into, whether it's one or all, we get all of it. We will get to see you do it all. Yeah. I'm going to keep making music and keep trying to play shows and releasing music and um yeah doing that thing that i gotta do for my own selfish reasons of just getting you know that kind of cathartic therapeutic thing that music does for me i'm just gonna keep doing that and that's really it awesome well yes please keep doing what you're doing because you know myself and many others out there appreciate you and and everything you've created i appreciate that very much thank you And there you have it, Vinny Caruana. Really good conversation. 
really nice person to talk to. Incredible stories, incredible stories. I actually didn't know that he had been writing and performing with Head Automatica until I started doing some research, until I talked to him and just that time out in San Francisco, writing with the band, playing those crazy shows that he described sounded like such a fun time. And of course, you know, coming up in the Long Island scene and putting together the movie life and finally starting his own band and doing his own thing. And I am the avalanche. He's done it all. He's done it all. The solo work and anyone who appreciates Jets to Brazil as much as I do, always a fan of that. Yeah, I, me too. <laughs> that's awesome. And I didn't know anything about the Head Automatica connection either. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So just great conversation. Really, really happy to talk to Vinny. So thank you, Vinny, for coming on the show. Uh, so let's talk about how we are doing, Will. Let's talk about us, yeah. our favorite subject. Yeah, definitely. And I want to start with you, you know, because we just met. I want to get to know you. I want our listeners to get to know you. Where did you grow up? What scene did you come up in? I grew up in the great city of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I was there. Start, that's where I started getting into heavy music and playing a bunch. Um, I think the first band of, of note that I was in was Prayer for Cleansing. And we started in Charlotte. And that was the, f- the first group that actually went out and started traveling and doing stuff and recording. And we're actually doing a reunion show in December as a benefit for a homie of ours that died for his family. Um, so that's going to be interesting. We haven't played since 2004. Is that the um, is that the Undying show that I've been I've been seeing advertised? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this guy John Rivera passed away recently, and uh, he was a huge part of the North Carolina scene from you know back in the late 90s um, up until recently, and uh, yeah. So we he wanted he wanted a show instead of a, a funeral or something like that so and he specifically asked for us uh, to come back and play uh, that's us being prayer for cleansing so it's uh yeah prayer undying um and they haven't played in forever that's going to be super exciting catharsis just old you know north carolina like powerhouse band and then uh, a few others code 7 is going to play do an album play through and uh yeah it's going to be sick Incredible show. Uh, my condolences for your friend. Uh, that's, that's tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's being he's being celebrated in the coolest way possible. So I'm sure he'd be pretty stoked. So yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, Charlotte is where I came up. Sorry, I'm, I went on in in another direction, but uh, yeah, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina now, which uh, isn't that far away from Charlotte, um, but different vibe. Um, I've raised a daughter here. I, she's 18. And yeah, I don't know what my next steps are in life, but yeah, I've been pretty, pretty happy in North Carolina. We'll see where life takes me though. Now we know you hooked up with Hope's Fall last year, stepping in for guitar. And like we talked about in last year's Furnace Fest recap episode, highly recommended episode to our listeners. If you haven't heard it yet, we recap last year's Furnace Fest with Vadim Taver and Josh Brigham from Hope's Fall. But yeah, you stepped in, Will, and you got it done. And it was seamless, seamless. And you weren't even just playing rhythms. You're playing leads. You're playing everything. You're doing backups. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but I can believe it now that I know you have previous experience with the band. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I still, I honestly, I feel like, you know, because those were my first shows back with the band. And then we've only had a, a, a couple since then. But uh, so it's been about a year. And I finally feel like I'm like comfortable. You know, I think I'm, I'm glad you to hear that my performances were on par with what people would expect from a Hope's Fall guitar player and backup vocalist and all that stuff. But um, now it's like, all right, now I'm not at Furnace Fest. It felt like I, I was just hanging on by a thread sort of, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I mean, that's understandable, you know, jumping into something that you hadn't done in a long time. Uh, but yeah, now it feels really comfortable. I feel really good. I'm having more fun on stage. I'm not getting confused by all the effects pedals I'm switching between <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just having more fun. Yeah. So it's, it's been awesome. Um, I, I, so I go to, I, I, yeah, so I live in Raleigh. It's about a two and a half hour, hour drive to Charlotte. So leading up to shows, I'm going down like every other week and rehearsing, hanging out with the guys. So it's, I'm don't, I don't live in the same town as them, but it's pretty much like I do. That's awesome. Yeah. Had you been playing music leading up to uh, rejoining with Hope's Fall? I mean, had you taken a lot of time off? What were you doing? Well, so 
2004, I had my daughter and that sort of, I just made a decision to sort of put the touring and all that stuff aside. So I stopped playing music on that level, but I didn't, I, di- I didn't stop playing music. I mean, I was doing a lot of local stuff here in Raleigh for years and years. Um, and I've got, I mean, I'm, I'm still playing in, in a, a couple Raleigh bands. Um, one's called Grog, which is, a uh, started as a solo project. Um, and now has become a band. And then, uh, another one called Shepherd, which is a new project, but that's going really well and super fun. Both those are more like the on the rock and roll side of black metal, I guess, is a good way to put it. But yeah, so like playing locally was was something I, I just I, did, I never stopped doing that. But bands that required travel um, weren't just were not an option, I guess. Um, now that my daughter is a full, you know, grown up human being, <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like I have a little more flexibility and a little more um, of an opportunity to get back out there and do some some shows on the road and, and, you know, with hopes fall, it's pretty cool. We're all sort of in the same boat. We've got, we got jobs, we've got families, but we all want to, you know, take advantage of the opportunity we have to go play different parts of the, of the world. In fact, um, do and do it at at our pace. Like there's no pressure. No one's making us do anything, but we're able to get out there and and do some things that we want to do and go some places we want to go and meet a bunch of people we haven't met um, or, catch up with old people from 20 something years ago. Yeah. So not, didn't stop playing music, but just did it a little bit differently there for a while. (laughs) Yeah. And it must feel good to be back doing it on this level, but you know, like you mentioned, you never stopped, but coming back into it and playing with these bands again and playing these bigger shows. And I'm sure seeing a lot of people that you haven't seen in a long time, it just must be a really good feeling. It's super cool. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know. It's, it feels like it's like a icing on the cake sort of situation in terms of the bands from back then, like, you know, like hopes fall and, and this like prayer for cleansing reunion. Like it's, I, I just kind of blown away that I get to still do things like this with those bands and yeah. And meeting, I mean, shoot, I, my memory sucks so bad. And like, but I, I see all these faces I remember. And then, and everybody have have a conversation where I admit that I don't remember the name, but <laughs> <laughs> but like I don't forget faces. So. Yeah, I don't remember anybody's name, but you know, I I'll see somebody and I'll be like, I know I've seen them somewhere before. Yeah, it's a trip, man. I mean, like Furnace Fest was just this a lot of that, you know, a lot of seeing people that I recognized and a lot of catching up with folks and looking forward to more of that. Unfor- yeah, I wish we were playing it this year, but. Uh, seems like every show we're playing these days is, is a lot of that seeing some old friends and catching up. So I guess you won't be at Furnace Fest this year. Unfortunately not. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We're not playing. And then I just, I, I booked some other stuff that weekend, so I'm not going to be able to go, but I will, I will certainly miss it. I mean, that I don't, I don't, I do not like festivals. I don't like outdoor shows. <laughs> I don't even like outdoor shows usually. Um, I'm just one of those old guys that's like, ah, I just want to see my favorite band in the smallest club possible. But, Furnace Fest is different, and that that's one I would I would love to go to every year. I mean, it's just a cool, cool, cool place, great bands, and, and a lot of cool people, and just an overall vibe that's really positive and, and mature, you know? Yeah, I, I too am not a fan of fests and large gatherings of people and being out in the sun all day, but I will put all of that aside to go to Furnace Fest because some of my friends are there. I get to meet a lot of cool people. I get to see every band I've ever liked and more, so uh, I can deal with it. Yeah, I agree completely. Prayer for Cleansing. I remember that band from back in the day. There was a metal hardcore crossover thing going on in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I used to listen to a lot of those bands, Undying, Prayer for Cleansing, Year of Our Lord, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I... I guess we, you know, North Carolina had a, had a, a, played a big role in that. Um, I mean, at the time, of course, we, we didn't know that it was going to be a big thing and, and we, it wasn't like premeditated. We weren't trying to create any sort of subgenre or anything like that, or, or, or even like join one, you know, it was just, we just, we were list we love, we grew up on hardcore, like seeing like hardcore stuff. And then we were listening to a bunch of black metal and death metal and started putting them all together. But, um, yeah, it's crazy how, how well that how it played out and how how well it's still received and yeah some of the bands were just really really good i think it'll happen again there's a black metal thing happening right now in heavy music 
that I think was kicked off by Def Heaven and some other bands. Mm -hmm. But I think it will circle back around to the really metallic stuff. It goes one of two ways. You start out really metal and go hardcore, or you start out really hardcore and go metal. And I think a lot of hardcore kids discovered metal and were trying that thing, the crossover. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that was the case with us. Um, it's funny because, I mean, I, I still play drums, but I haven't played that aggressively in, in years. <laughs> so we've got this show coming up, you know, it's not till December, but I'm like, whoo, I need to get back in shape, man. I can still play all this stuff, but it's like the endurance the, the, the endurance you need to get through a full set of playing that with that much energy. I mean, it's like, whoa, all right. I'm feeling my age right now a little bit. So you played drums in Prayer for Cleansing? I did, yeah. I grew up playing drums, really. Like, that was my primary instrument. And then eventually, you know, my house was like the rehearsal house. So people would just leave guitars and shit around. And I eventually started picking up guitars and writing riffs on them. And that led to me really falling in love with guitar. So now I pretty much just play guitar. So this prayer show with playing drums and having to do so really fast <laughs> is... Uh, is is a challenge but no i mean it's coming along fine i'm i'm yeah growing up playing drums um so prayer for cleansing uh played drums in that and then that led to between the berry to me which i played in as a founding member and i only played on the first self-titled album but <clears throat> yeah i played a, i played nothing but drums back then and now i play pretty much nothing but guitar so i don't know <laughs> i don't have a good reason for that that's pretty incredible, though, because Prayer for Cleansing and Between the Buried and Me, that's like no slouch on drumming. I mean, that's pretty intricate drumming. And to be able to just pick up guitar and do everything you're doing and now join Hopesful and play those songs as well, I mean, you must be pretty versatile. I guess so. Yeah, I don't I guess I'm I'm pretty good at, at, a, at a handful of things. I'm, I don't feel like I'm completely great at any one thing but i i just like being okay at some stuff like a bunch of different stuff yeah so far so good I, and i keep getting these great opportunities to to do both you know guitar and drums yeah and props to you that drumming is so hard i i went to band practice early last week to try to get some drum sounds you know so i could maybe piece together a song at home i couldn't even play i was trying to do a very basic beat and i just couldn't even do it and then my leg got really tired and I couldn't even hit the kick drum. And I was like, this is just sad. <laughs> this is just really sad. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Like, uh, yeah, you really have like there there are certain muscle groups that are that you use playing drums that you just don't use el elsewhere in life. So if you're not playing drums, then you're not exercising those muscles. And uh, it's interesting how quickly it goes away. So if you're if you're playing drums for prayer for cleansing i imagine just doing that could keep you in pretty good shape um yeah it's definitely helping out um just practicing on on a regular basis practicing that type of drumming it's a workout man at this point in life i really need that so <laughs> i'm okay with it so what do you have coming up now i think josh told us there was some hopes fall stuff coming up and i can't remember any of it <laughs> um he oh he said there's going to be new music at some point but i don't think he said what but Tell us what's going on with any of your bands. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Hopes Fall, we've got a, uh, there's a festival called First in Flight. That's, this is the first year of that festival, but it's happening in October, early October in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it's a festival composed of nothing but North Carolina bands. So that's going to be fun. And we're playing, I think we're closing it out on the Sunday night of that fest. And we're doing another full playthrough of Satellite Years since we're still on the 20th anniversary of that record. Yeah, so that's going to be fun. And then, yes, some new music is coming out. I don't want to say any more than I should, but there are some. there is some new music that will be released. Yeah, and we're booking some more shows. Uh, I, I'm again, again, I don't know if I can say exactly what we're doing, but um, there are more shows in 2023 coming up. We are you know, actively trying to write some new music, and uh, we're spending most of our time rehearsing for the shows, but uh, when we can, Josh and I are trying to come up with some new riffs and uh, stringing them along together into songs. So um, yeah, there's a lot happening with Hope's Fall and I'm excited to talk about some of the stuff I can't really talk about yet, but um, some really cool opportunities coming up. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to more from Hope's Fall always. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> no, like I said, I'm, 
yeah, I'm excited to to do the stuff we're doing, but I'm I'm also excited because I just love the band. Yeah, I love when a fan of the band ends up joining the band because they always say like, you know, I got to join a band I love or something to that effect. And it's just got to be a really good feeling. It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's about, you know, like these days I'm really and I'm sure anybody in their 40s that's still playing music is, is we get real choosy and I'm very particular about the projects I, I take on these days and so having something like this happen where yeah hopes fall needed to fill in that turned into a full-time gig um it was great i didn't even have to think about if if that was something i wanted to do it was like a a definite yes (laughs) exactly that's something you just say yes to without even thinking about it Mm -hmm. certainly well that's it for this episode we are out of time out of time but lucky for you we are a weekly sometimes twice a weekly show And I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. And I'm going to leave you with something a little different this week. I did a mashup, remix, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Okay, so check this out. HBO did the Juice World documentary, right? And in that documentary, there's an acoustic version of Fast. This guy is playing an acoustic guitar and Juice freestyles and sings the song Fast. It's really cool. It's really awesome. And I remember it got stuck in my head and I was like, man, I wish there was a studio version of that, you know, which sadly can never happen now. But I realized that the acoustic guitar kind of sounded like Dave Matthews band Crash. So I took that, I took some violin and I took some other stuff and I pieced it all together and I made this Juice World Fast Acoustic Remix. So I will end the show with that and I'll see you next week. Thanks everybody for listening. And until next time. Next story to be continued. Yeah.